I'm Bobby Kuzma. I'm a systems engineer with Core Security. Um, pardon my limping around. I managed to get myself injured about a month ago and haven't healed up quite right. But uh, one of the things that I get an opportunity to do that Core, thankfully, is very supportive of is I get to play in a lot of different areas with a lot of different technologies. And one of the areas that I was kind of weak on was hardware and then reverse engineering. So I figured, you know, let's let's kind of do a deep dive and we've got all of these gadgets that are getting hooked up to networks these days that quite frankly have absolutely no no place being hooked up to networks. So we hear about this on the news, we see the occasional uh, announcements, but what all what all is actually involved in digging into these devices? So the whole point here tonight is to get you an overview of what kind of problem are we dealing with and what kind of tools are available to us so that you too can go in and explore and figure out if that uh, nice little home automation gadget that uh, your significant other wants you to set up is actually going to give away the farm. So our problem here is that we've got more and more devices that are network enabled because Ethernet chips are cheap and Wi-Fi chips are cheap. They're under 10 cents a pop when you're buying them in bulk. So it costs practically nothing to include these in devices. Now, you, know, you start seeing things like refrigerators that are network enabled. Why? Because someone in marketing thought it was a good idea. And we know what happens when people in marketing have good ideas. Um, what about light bulbs? <laughs> light bulbs. Uh, cameras, you know, the whole bevy of gadgets that probably ought not be connected that are getting there. And embedded systems programming is different than the traditional uh, larger computer system or client server programming that we're dealing with. There is a totally different experiential base and bias in the developers that come out of the embedded systems communities versus those of us that have to deal with you know, public facing websites or inter internal applications. And this experience is a problem because the current state of security knowledge and best practices in the embedded system space is about where general software was back in the 1990s. And that was not a happy, fun time for anyone uh, on the receiving end of that. So we call it the Internet th of Things. It's really the internet of bleep code. You can fill in the appropriate blank there. Uh, those of you who might have heard me speak in other venues know what word I'd be using there. So what kind of things are we talking about? Now, my definition of internet of things covers industrial control systems. Some of you might disagree with that, but basically let's treat it as anything that hooks up to a network that does not have a direct human interface to it for the management functions that are exposed on the network. So we got things, your industrial control, we've got your access control and physical security. We start seeing a lot more surveillance cameras and uh, card readers. Um, getting on there, uh, power management devices, uh, things that interface with HVAC, your refrigerator. I, oh, there's a, I saw a blender that's Wi-Fi enabled. I, 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 I really don't know why, what, what, what use case justified putting that chip in there. But hey, it exists. So, and then you've got things like printers. How many of you have, how many of you keep up on your uh, firmware patches for your network enabled printers? Are you paranoid much? Good, you should be. So in these organizations, oftentimes while you know, your IT and your, your operations and your InfoSec staff, they're up on, you know, we know we've got a patch that needs to be applied to this. Let's get it done. Let's get it tested. But some of these embedded devices aren't owned by IT, and they aren't owned by InfoSec. Who owns the prox card readers if they're riding over the network? Physical security, probably. Who owns the surveillance cameras? Who owns the power management uh, for the building that manages the HVAC to keep it the spend under control? The Russians. Well, duh, or the Chinese. Um, 
So these are issues that are outside of the traditional scope that our systems have been built to address. And again, we're in the 1990s when it comes to actually dealing with these issues and coding around them. In fact, a lot of embedded devices don't even have a mechanism for easily updating their firmware. And they don't have mechanisms for ensuring that the firmware that you are putting on them is firmware that should be on them. So when we start going through this, we see a lot of problems over and over and over again. And those of you who were in IT or InfoSec back in the late 90s, early 2000s, this is pretty much the list that you were dealing with then on, on everything. But we got better. We got smarter. We learned how to deal with this. And we learned to be better. Because the attackers, there's more of them than there are of us and all that fun stuff. So you know, default passwords. Um, how many of you have ever seen a, a video IQ camera? No? Huh? So these things were really, really popular in critical infrastructure and in the gaming industries, shall we say, because they had onboard analytics and all kinds of fun, fun things like that. So one of the cool things that I found when, for me as someone who occasionally has to attack these devices, is when you do a password reset on them, it doesn't just reset the password. It doesn't just reset the network settings. It rolls back the firmware to factory. You can't get firmware for those suckers anymore. <laughs> so. You end up with like 2007 vintage uh, code running on those devices if you have to reset them these days. We've got backdoor passwords that are embedded in devices that they're statically assigned that you can't find. We're, we're finding that all the time. You know, Juniper, we had a problem with that. So it's not just these embedded devices. But because there's so many of them, who audits them all? Who, who has time to do that? Obviously, people who are bored like I do. Um, command injection. So you know, the, the classic is your home router. You pass the right string to it, and all of a sudden, it's gone and inserted a new user. Or it's shifted the DNS that it's handing out to something that's controlled by uh, the Ukrainian mob or similar. I, I could roll the attribution dice, so we could insert threat actor of your choice there. Uh, you know, SQL injections. Um, and then again, we've got the complete and utter lack of update paths. Uh, for a lot of these devices, they were developed once, they were intended to ship, and there is no provision whatsoever for them being updated. Medical devices. Did anyone just cringe? The FDA very, very recently flat out said, for the love of God, patch them. You don't have to recertify the entire device. But most medical organizations and most medical device manufacturers are still on the, well, it has, the whole thing has to be certified. And that's how we end up with debacles like the, uh, a year or so ago, the Hospira uh, IV drug pumps, the ones that you could you know, telnet into uh, without authentication and you were root, that had a couple of backdoor passwords that the drug database you could update. So. Um, just badness when we don't have provisions for updating code. So we have this lovely gadget. Uh, they're about $50 on eBay if you want something that you know has vulnerabilities on it to play with. And the uh, key for programming them, it's the same key on every single one of these devices that, that has ever shipped. $20 on eBay. So creds are in plain text. The database, the, the whole selling point of these was they eliminate errors by the nursing staff because you put the drug in and it has a barcode on it that the pharmacy generates. And the device has a barcode reader. And it reads the barcode and decides, OK, this is this drug in this concentration. These are the hard-coded safety limits. So you cannot give too much of it. Well, if you can go in and change the database, what's a little extra morphine? <laughs> And these, these are the ones that the FDA said you are not allowed to hook humans up to anymore. They're still in use. They're, they're, they're still in use, and it's, it's very, very bad. Um, also, the uh, keying. It's one of those cute little uh, seven pin uh, round key jobs. All the pins are set to the same depth. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you might have uh, noticed in your travels a device that looks kind of like this. This is the HID Edge Solo card reader. It has common firmware with the more industrial Vertex, V-E-R-T-X, uh, controller. This just in the last month, uh, there's a unauthenticated command injection that you could use to do things like unlock the doors with a UDP packet. Or you could do other nefarious things like inserting a card of your own designation into the system with 24-7 you know, access. Now, I know that the best practice is that these things should be on a separate network, either via VLANing or via actual physical segregation from the rest of the network. How many organizations do you think actually do that? Yeah. And this whole scenario is still under active investigation. Not all of the bits and pieces of the device have been thoroughly audited, so there's probably going to be more that we find. And you have to be a authorized partner to get the firmware update. You can't install it yourself as an end user. Oops. Some of the installers. I'm sorry? Neither can some of the installers who sell it. Yeah, because HID is really, really twitchy about the authorization. So I wouldn't want one of those on my network. So. For those of you who get bored, this probably sounds like, you know, it's a, it's a good, good Friday night or good weekend or good all that time that you're supposed to be working. So what, what can you do? What kind of tools do you need in order to grab a device and go? So I've got this process that I've kind of started with. I find a device, you know, usually on eBay or I'm rattling around. Um, my fiance's father's been in and out of hospitals a lot lately, so I'm getting pictures of all the medical devices he's being hooked up to. That's been a really, really useful uh, shopping list, if you will, because most of these gadgets, um, unless you're in a really high-end facility, they're not new. They've been around for a while. So we start with a device. And before we even take it apart, because if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Sometimes the manufacturers actually put the firmware online in a binary blob. You, know, you get them for your, a lot of the IP cameras, they're available like that. Your printers, available like that. Um, get the blob, and then there's a lovely tool called Binwalk. Has anyone ever played with Binwalk? No? Yes? OK. So Binwalk is freaking awesome. It takes a binary blob that you know nothing about. You don't know how it's encoded. You don't know what's in it. It goes through and looks for patterns inside of it and then peels away the crunchy outer layers to let you into the soft and interesting center. Um, so if it's a binary blob that's a tar zip that's been renamed, It'll figure that out and extract it. And then you end up with a file system or some other set of blobs. And if you can do that, then you don't need to go through all of the, the interesting uh, hardware tricks that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, you can just go on to town. And it'll do that recursively. And it literally requires like binwalk space dash e space file name. It's not that hard. And apparently now that Windows 10 has got the Ubuntu user space, you can run it on Windows. So what do we do if the vendor isn't posting firmware? If they're, they're, being, they're being obstinate. It's almost like they don't want someone like me poking around in their stuff. Well, we've got a couple of tricks that we can use. And this is where it really starts getting fun. We've got a variety of tools that you might want to add to your hardware hacking workbench. We've got screwdrivers, pry bars, and occasionally you get those weird screws that you know, they think that because it's not a standard, they'll, they'll slow you down when you can spend 20 bucks on Amazon and get a set of 109 security bits of various types and flavors. 
Um, if you're looking for a decent taking apart devices without completely destroying them kit, uh, and you don't have an existing tool base, um, there's a, a kit from iFixit that's actually really good in terms of the scope and type of tools, and it's priced at about what the individual tools would run you. So if you don't want to spend a couple of hours shopping for everything and you want everything in one bit, that's the one that I would recommend. I really recommend that you get a decent document camera. That's one of the, the jobbies that looks down on whatever your work area. Why? Because you're going to want to take video of you tearing this thing down. Because who remembers how to put things back together just after they've taken them apart once? And ideally, we want to be able to put these back together. Or if that's not really feasible, you, know, you order like five or six of them. Look for bulk deals. It gets cheaper that way. Uh, some kind of container to organize the parts, because there will be a lot of parts. Um, tearing down that Hospira PCA pump, there were about 200 screws. There probably needed only to be about five of them. Get yourself a good multimeter. Um, I strongly believe that your electrical testing equipment should have a bright orange uh, wrapper on it. I, I do recommend the Fluke stuff, but Fluke is not on the cheap side you're going to need some kind of hardware interface that can handle JTAG. And I'll go a little bit more into that. And you need some basic skills for searching for things. Because in a lot of cases, you're going to be taking apart the hardware and having to look at the chips on the board and their labeling to figure out what it is you're dealing with. What does that chip do? What kind of interface does it have? How can I manipulate it? They usually don't give you a manual for reverse engineering their own device, usually. So we've got JTAG. And JTAG is Joint Test Action Group. This was a standard that was put together some time ago to address the problem of how the heck do we troubleshoot these complex digital circuits without having to build all these test points into it, or a set of test points for every single chip. So JTAG lets you, as a, chip, as a board designer, take all of the chips on the board combine them together into a bus that's accessed from one access point and allows you to go in and just like with a debugger on your uh, web apps or you know, your client server stuff, you can set breakpoints, you can pause the code, you can step through it, you can access and manipulate memory locations. And we use that functionality to go and rip code out of those chips. Now, the implementation varies from processor to processor and even from even within architecture families. You know, your major families, you got x86, which I found embedded devices that have honest to god i386 chips in them, which makes no sense, but hey, it's x86, it makes it more fun. Um, your ARM chips, there's a bunch of different flavors of ARM, all of which vary, and the JTAG varies with it. And with this, most of the time, unless the designer is being paranoid or they're deliberately being stupid, you can rip out the firmware bit by bit via JTAG. It takes a while, but hey. And this is the same tool set that's used to debrick phones or debrick routers. You're bypassing the processor. You're writing it directly onto the flash. Come on. There we go. So there is no, like, standard JTAG connector like there is USB. Uh, it can be done as a group with eight pins. It could be done as a group with 14 pins. I've seen 20 pins. I've seen 10 pins. It varies, but there's only a couple of pins that actually matter. Okay, We've got test data in, test data out, exactly what it says on the 10. You've got test mode select. That tells it, are we pausing the processor? Are we doing something different with it? Um, the test clock, uh, because we are dealing with uh, processing that works on cycles, we do need to provide a clock uh, to sync the processor speed up with what we are talking about on the uh, extraction side. And then there's a pin that actually resets the processor to a, a known good state. So this is the main board from that Hospira PCA pump. Now, I've actually got it in my bag there, and I'll, I'll trundle it out if anyone wants to actually look at it and touch it. 
and set it on fire. So the processor, usually real easy to find. It's the one that has a lot of pins going in every single direction on there. In this case, it's an Atmel ARM processor. So it's relatively slow, but it's a well-defined uh, interface. There's lots of documentation about it. And most of these chips, you can get the documentation. They're available, from, if not from the manufacturer directly, uh, it's going to be available from places like DigiKey or uh, Mauser Electronics, where you might be, where you're, you'd be able to buy these parts in bulk. The other chip that we care about typically on these is the flash memory on the system. Now, the flash memory in this case, uh, it's an AMD chip. Um, it's got about eight meg worth of storage on it, which is it, it's pretty decent for an embedded device that just needs a database of about 50 common drugs in it, which, oh, no audit trail. That's the other thing. It doesn't keep an audit trail between power cycles. So that uh, drug database is basically saved onto the firmware and then uh, occasionally updated via mechanisms which are not well authenticated. And then the blue bits are the JTAG ports. So in this particular case, it was a 14-pin uh, JTAG as it was described by the hardware manufacturer. So these guys were not deliberately obfuscating anything. They were trying to make it easy for uh, debugging and uh, diagnosing their own gear. This was not a, a secure piece of hardware from the design. So the video IQ bits. Uh, this was kind of interesting because it's actually two separate embedded systems on one board. So you've got a Texas Instruments DaVinci ARM processor which has uh, digitization uh, hardware. So the camera on it is actually an analog camera and the TI chip digitizes that and it produces a, an uncompressed uh, video stream at either standard definition or high definition for some of the units. Then that communicates via Ethernet to the IMX27 uh, processor, which is in the orange. And this projector isn't terribly doing it. But that's the TI chip, and that's the uh, IMX chip. That IMX chip has the SATA interface for the hard drive on the system. It has the Ethernet controller for communicating with the rest of the world. It has a USB. It has serial, and it's got a separate Ethernet interface that is used to communicate between the two sides of the system. Now, the firmware for both of them is actually loaded off the same Samsung flash memory chip, which is the one over there in red. And what clued me off that this was a really, really weird system was the fact that there were there's actually two separate labeled JTAG ports, one for each. Uh, processor. So what I, I suspect is that at some point in the product evolution, these were actually separate boards. Um, this was a, a retrofit to make it a smaller package. And what they did was they just slapped it together onto one, uh, one main board. And there's a separate power distribution board, but we usually don't care about uh, power management for things like, that, things like this. Um, although, if you can control the power, you can do interesting things with the processors um, by glitching them, by giving an arbitrary low voltage and then spiking it up. And that sometimes can defeat uh, restrictions that have been made uh, by the developer or the implementer to try and keep you from doing the fun things that you know, I want to do. Now, the engineers are able to obfuscate this. They don't always have a. Uh, a nice, well-defined set of test points on the board. Uh, sometimes you have to kind of go looking around. And any cluster of five separate pins could potentially be JTAG. But how do you know what pins are what? So you pick up one of these guys. Uh, Joe Grand uh, developed this. It's called the JTAGulator. So what this does, it's a uh, propeller, uh, parallax propeller chip on there. And you've got 24 channels of potential uh, hookup uh, on the board. So you can wire probes up to the board, and then you connect in. This emulates a serial port. Connect in on your system and basically tell it, these are the channels that are hooked up. 
jtagulate. And it goes through and will try every combination of the ports that you've hooked up to identify what port is what. Uh, so that when you hook up your actual uh, gear for dumping the, J dumping the uh, memory out via JTAG, uh, you can do so. And you don't have to manually try thousands, potentially, of combinations on the system. Now, what's also neat is the JTAGulator will also reverse engineer uh, serial ports. So if there's a UART on the uh, board, it will figure out what pins are what. And then it will actually do a pass through so you can go directly on it. Um, so those uh, nice HID devices, have, they use U-boot. And you can actually stop the bootloader with, uh, via serial and dump the firmware out via U-boot. So um, one, one neat thing that uh, I found is when these vendors are using open source technologies, you go to their you know, GPL page where they go, here's all the stuff we used and here's the links to the source code so that we're compliant and we don't get uh, Richard Stallman bugging us about whatever. Um, that gives you a pretty good idea of what they're using and then you can tailor your strategies based on the software that they are presumably using or think that they're using if it's open source. And then there's a couple of different technologies that you can use uh, to actually do the JTAG interface. Now you could go and buy a, a, a call it professional uh, JTAG rig at a cost of anywhere between 500 and several thousand dollars or you can go drop like 40, 50 bucks on a bus pirate. And the bus pirate's really, really useful. Um, not just, you can use it for not just JTAG, but other serial uh, communication protocols. And you can even use it with the appropriate probes as a do it yourself logic analyzer. Um, it's really flexible depending on what firmware you've got loaded up on it. Um, this, and then a tool called Open OCD or Open On Chip Debug. Uh, allows you to interface directly with the JTAG and then send commands to dump out memory and look for fun things like that. So once we've got the firmware image, whether it's via dumping out the flash or via the vendor made the bin image available, we can do a couple of very basic things going through that. You know, we want to look for passwords that are hard coded on the device or that may be default passwords. And, go rip those suckers out and crack them. A lot of the time these devices are running Linux. Almost every one of these devices that I touch are running some flavor of Linux because it's simple, it's cheap, and it works. And you don't need something with guaranteed real-time execution uh, on most embedded devices. Some you do, and those will use you know, your QNX or, or some other dedicated purpose-built RTOS. But for most of the devices that we're going to encounter these days, uh, Linux has unfortunately won uh, that space, or fortunately, depending on your, your point of view with that. So I like looking for SSH certs, because you'd be amazed how many of these things have uh, identical SSH certs deployed. They don't, on power up, generate a new one from a, a, a seed like you know we would want them to do. Um, so you end up with the same certificate on every one of the devices that are floating around out there, which is just as bad as shipping every IV pump you've ever made with the same key. Um, like using Burp to attack the web management interface. Most of these devices have some kind of web management interface. Burp is the best tool for going through and looking for people doing stupid stuff. And remember, the origins of OWASP as an organization where we want to categorize and develop appropriate mitigations for these common vulnerabilities that we keep seeing every time we touch something. Well, most of the embedded device community hasn't gotten that memo. And they're still writing crappy code. And they're still doing the same stupid things that you could pop a web app with years ago, over and over and over again. It, it's embarrassing, but it's, it's there. And then you know, sending random input to the device to see what happens. That's always fun. I like using American Fuzzy Lop for that, but there are other tools available out there that you may find work better with your workflow or budget. Um, there are many commercial tools in that space that are quite nice, but they're also quite expensive. So once we've got in there and we've looked for the low-hanging fruit, we actually want to break into the binaries and do some reverse engineering. Now, 
whether you've got experience with reverse engineering or not, it's not terribly difficult to start getting the gist of it, particularly when you have tools uh, that are able to graph out the call flow within the application. You can start getting a feel of entry points, uh, where code execution starts, and what decision points are being made on there. So if you've got a function that's obviously being called by the login form, and it does a comparison to a fixed value, you found yourself a back door. That's hard coded in, just like uh, we had with Juniper and uh, Fortinet recently. So IDAPRO is the professional grade industry standard, but it is very expensive for someone who isn't doing reverse engineering professionally. So I like the uh, radar uh, suite with Bakken. Um, gives me 90% of the functionality and 90% of the user interface. There's, it covers the most frequently encountered architectures, uh, which are going to be x86, ARM, and MIPS. Um, Yes, there will occasionally be some devices that have some kind of exotic architecture that you won't be able to deal with on there. But if you really want to do it that, that much, figure out the uh, assembly language for it, update radar, and make the whole community happy. Yeah, you know, scratch your own itch. And at this point, we've given you kind of the basics of going through and what to do and what tools to leverage to go through. So please, go forth and hack all of the things before someone with much less benign intent does it and you know, creates an episode of Homeland or something. Yes, sir? Question. So did, in your research, did you come across uh, hardware that had the JPAC boards burned out? Uh, yes. Um, actually. What did you do to come to that? <laughs> The uh, video IQ one, the DaVinci JTAG port is actually fused out. So um, I don't know yet if it's a software fuse or a hardware fuse that they did. So uh, just to circle back, there the most common trick to, uh, other than completely omitting the JTAG ports is during the QA process, after the board's been manufactured and checked, you can either with a appropriate command blow a physical fuse in the, that's built into the chip, or you can set a software fuse uh, that checks for a particular bit. It's one of the first things that's loaded by the processor. And if that bit is present, it will disable the JTAG functionality. Now, for all of the digital technology that we have, it's still analog under the hood. And if you can manipulate the power going into the processor, you can sometimes make it glitch and skip that load step. So that's software you're talking about. Correct. That, that's in software. Now, if the JTAG is completely disabled, then another trick that you can do that is getting much more advanced is to actually desolder the flash memory, hook that up to a, a pro, uh, EEPROM programmer, and then strip it off that way. But that, that's getting into the really hardcore reverse engineering steps. Um, there are also, for some of the more common um, packages, there's clamps that you can get that you don't even have to desolder it. You just drop the clamp on the chip, it aligns the pins, and then you're able to power up just that chip and then read it off. Those are also options, but um, it's a decent EEPROM programmer is going to start at like six, seven hundred bucks and then it goes up from there. Uh, so that's Budget-wise, that may not be something that someone would want to get into if they're doing this as a hobby. Um, but if you're doing it professionally, then by all means. And one of the other things with uh, grabbing the flash is there may be additional obfuscation involved. It may be stored in an encrypted or obfuscated format on the flash chip. But the bootloader should be accessible. Um, and you go through. Use the reverse engineering techniques, figure out what it's doing. Sometimes it's just doing an exclusive OR. Um, rip it off, deobfuscate it, and then go to town from there. Did you come across encrypted serial communications? Not in any of the devices that I've played with so far. Um, for the most part, uh, particularly on the, the internal to the device serial communications, uh, they are uh, typically in the clear.
um, in that Hospira unit, there's actually three, three boards in the system. One board with its own ARM processor that handles Ethernet communication, then that communicates via serial to the main board, then the main board communicates via serial to another board with its own independent ARM processor that has a USB wireless stick plugged into it. That's how they do wireless on that. It's not an integrated chip. It's a, it's a post-manufacture option, if you will. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you. Uh, go ahead. So um, have you been able to connect the dots where these kinds of things are running on servers, running on things that we in the app software world are relying on, and those are actually compromises of what is transferring. So it's sort of the, you know, it's a, uh, engineer your own tack. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that would be the most likely thing. Yes. Side channel. So typically, um, your network gear all has JTAG ports. Yeah. Uh, your big Cisco supervisors have JTAG ports. Um, while I have a stack of Cisco 6500 supervisors sitting in my garage, I haven't gotten around to attaching JTAG probes to them and seeing if I can get interesting things from them. Um, your motherboards all have JTAG built into them. That is accessible via the PCI slot. And uh, thanks to uh, our pal, Mr. Snowden, we know that the NSA has JTAG-based implants for manipulating devices in their little uh, bag of tricks. So if someone else has figured it out, others have and will figure that out. And I know that there are a couple of groups that are expressly attempting to recreate all of the bag of tricks that was disclosed in an open manner so that we can figure out better ways to defend against them. Yeah, I, I believe that things along that line are also being done when you may enter some countries that customs say, oh, we have to look at this first and then give it back to you the next day. That is entirely possible and plausible given some of the uh, state organized uh, intelligence services uh, and their particular goals and mission. Um, but I don't have any firsthand knowledge or confirmation of that. It would be very interesting to take a bevy of devices into non-permissive regimes and see what kind of goodies get added to them while you're, you're visiting. Yeah. But there's, there's a number of firms that therefore would have their sensitive people travel with nothing and then have it handed to them once they're in there that had been delivered securely. So, you know, okay. like, you know, I guess 10 years ago it would have been, here's your Blackberry. Of course, now it would be something else, but, you know. Yeah, kind of the same reason why I don't take my cell phone to DEF CON. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, okay. I have a stack of burners for that. What? So, a lot of journalists have, like, throwaway phones. Oh, yeah. Burners. Burners. You know, they go to Russia, they bring a separate phone, they have right. everything just get rid of it. Yep. Yep. And, of course, you know, using a clean SIM on a dirty phone is a good way to get yourself compromised. Explain, please. Uh, so back a couple of years ago, we, uh, we, and by we I mean our government, uh, conducted an operation in Italy without sanction from the Italian authorities. And uh, they uh, renditioned a gentleman to a third party jurisdiction. And the uh, CIA snatch team was compromised because they used clean sims and dirty phones and the Italian government was able to piece the entire operation together based on using tools and techniques that the FBI gave them to help their counter-terror operations. Um, there was a talk up at Black Hat a couple of years ago on that subject that is fascinating to watch. What do you define as a dirty phone? A phone that has been previously used in other operations or in operations areas that may have had its uh, information collected. Yes, sir. I know this talk is about embedded systems, but when you have, let's say, a snatch team and they're using these burners, uh -huh. and all these burners get activated at the same time, and then you can correlate that, that mm -hmm. this group of phones is in the same area, suddenly if you, if you do have that correlation going on and you've got that observation, 
already in place, then you know something is about to... Traffic analysis is a wonderful thing. And I, I know that there are some vendors that manufacture ATM machines that are actually starting to use um, sniffing on GSM uh, to correlate devices that are nearby so that they can build patterns for uh, skimming attacks and similar. So like the retail, um, it's like a it's yeah it's a it's a civilian version of the Stingray. Yeah. Or the retail systems that you know Macy's is starting mm -hmm. to use and whatnot, where you walk into their store. Yep. Anything else, folks? No. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me.